good morning. Sorry, this always takes me a little bit to get ready because my greatest fear is this turning on while I'm singing. So I refuse to get it ready beforehand just in case Ed forgets that mute button up there. Well, welcome. If you guys, this is your last opportunity um, to be notified that Jeff is not speaking today. I don't feel bad for you because he let you know last week. We let you know in announcements. But here's your last opportunity to run out those doors. Um, thanks for having me, Jeff. Thanks for having me, you guys. Yeah, I'll see you, Mike. I keep that in mind for Hanukkah on Thursday. Uh, but I'm Brandon, the youth and media director here. Also, the brother-in-law to the second most famous person in this church, Isaiah the drummer. Um, yep. Um, yeah, I have the privilege of speaking today. Uh, today might feel more like a lecture, but I'm hoping that it's information that uh, leaves us inspired uh, and ready to go out these doors, uh, just filled with hope uh, and confidence in the good news of Jesus. So uh, it might be a little, a little bit different than what you're used to, uh, a lot of reading, a lot of quotes and stuff like that, but I, I'm doing it so that it's not my words, it's the words of experts and stuff like that. So yeah, we're going to get into a little bit of science. And as you know, I don't have a PhD in any scientific uh, area, but I've done a little bit of reading and I know some people who do. So uh, we're going to get into it though. Uh, we are hopping into the book of First Peter, and as Jeff has explained, this is a church undergoing extreme persecution. Uh, this is kind of the era in which the temple ends up being destroyed just a few years later by this guy named Nero. Uh, if you guys want to look up Nero on your own time, he was uh, a terrible Roman dictator. Uh, he just did terrible things to Christians and Jews and uh, many other people. Um, but, so Paul or Peter is trying to give this church, these set of churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, uh, just some hope in persecution. Uh, I give you guys that context because as we look at our verse, without that context, it might seem a little weird. Um, or maybe it's actually even weirder now that we have the context. But we'll get right into it. Here's the focus text for today. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Um, which is irony. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. That's going to be kind of where we spend our bulk today. Uh, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went out and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. We'll dig into that passage, but it's a little weird, but we'll keep going. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So we're going to move a little differently because I don't want to end on that weird part. Uh, I want to end uh, with, with some hope. So we're going to actually explain the end of this verse. And then I'll kind of go through it, and we'll end kind of in the middle uh, with that reason for a hope that we have. So um, we're going to go starting at verse 17. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And here's, here's where we're going to kind of get into it. After being made alive... He went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago. God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. We're going to go into four different views on this section. 
Uh, but the main point that we want to walk away with uh, is that Jesus also suffered. So it starts with, hey, do good because, hey, if you're going to do good, generally people aren't going to harm you. But even if they do, look at what Christ did. He suffered, and yet it brought our vindication. That is kind of the sum of this passage. We'll get into the three major phrases that contribute to the confusion. Uh, the being made alive, after being made alive, what does that mean? He went and made proclamation, what does that mean, to the imprisoned spirit. So those are kind of the three phrases that offer a lot of confusion uh, in theological circles. There's four major views on this. One is Christ is preaching through Noah in the time of Noah to the people there. Um, second view is that Jesus is making proclamation to Old Testament saints post-death. So in between that time where he died and rose again, he descended into hell uh, and then preached to the, the Old Testament saints. Uh, view three is that Jesus is descending into hell and kind of giving people a last chance. Uh, and then I'll get into the fourth view because it's the one that the most scholars uh, agree on. But uh, I'll say why I personally don't think these three views are the best explanations. Uh, Christ preaching to Noah. Christ preaching through Noah. It just, it's a little bit weird in the way that it, it uh, talks about it. After being made alive, why is it saying after being made alive if he's preaching through Noah? Um, making proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Uh, exit to like the ark and stuff. This one, not a ton of scholars hold the view on the ark. Um, they're talking about Jesus descending into hell. So there's a reason that I don't think Jesus descended into hell. One is because the thief on the cross, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. So it doesn't make sense that Jesus descended into hell for three days if uh, he was also in paradise with the thief on the cross. That, to me, doesn't make a ton of sense. Also, why specifically mention just Noah? Why just the days of Noah? Why not mention all the Old Testament saints or uh, all the Old Testament people um, who he's giving a second chance to? Why just the, the people in Noah's day? So those are kind of the, the reasons why I don't personally hold to those three views. The fourth view, uh, which to me makes the most sense, uh, most scholars agree on this point, um, but it's also the weirdest. So, we'll get into it. Fourth view is uh, Christ... Oh, what's this? On our sheet. There we go. I don't want to give away the, what the scholars say. Um, the fourth view uh, is that this is like the Genesis 6 case, which I don't know if you guys remember last time we talked about the Nephilim and this weird thing that happened in Genesis 6. You guys should go look at it. Where angels somehow came to humanity and had relations with women. It's the weirdest passage probably in the Bible, but most scholars say this is what that is referring to. In the days of Noah, uh, to these spirits that were imprisoned, Christ is going to these spirits and not proclaiming a second chance, but proclaiming victory. He's proclaiming victory over the spiritual realm. Uh, and this is what the New Testament commentator and theologian Thomas R. Schreiner says, the majority view among scholars today is that the text describes Christ's proclamation of victory and judgment over the evil angels, or in, in Genesis 6, they're called the sons of God, not, not necessarily angels. These evil angels, according to Genesis 6, 1 to 4, had sexual relations with women and were imprisoned because of their sin. The point of the passage, then, is not that Christ descended into hell, but as in 3.22, his victory over the angelic powers. Um... This is also pretty common in first century Judaism. Uh, this was a very common belief that yeah, these specific sons of God or angels were being put in chains until a, a time of judgment. Um, also, Jude 6, and the book of Enoch uh, also talks about this, but in Jude 6 it says this, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains, for judgment on the great day. So, take, take that uh, as it is. Uh, make your own opinions on it. You guys could do your research on your own time, but that's just kind of my, where I landed on this, where the commentators generally land. Um, but the main point is that Christ suffered 
before doing good, and yet it brought our vindication, regardless of whatever view you, you land on. Uh, but Jesus brought our victory through his suffering. Martin Luther, uh, who said a lot of things, said this about this passage. A wonderful text this is, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, but I do not know for a certainty just what Peter means. So if you're confused, you join good company with Martin Luther, who many people say was a great theologian. So there you go. Okay, now we'll move on to the second part of this. Uh, and this water symbolizes baptism, talking about the day of Noah and the flood that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Christ. So that's a weird connection. You go from Noah and the flood to Christ all of a sudden, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. What he's saying here is the ark was a precursor, an image of Christ. So water, uh, back in, like, in Jewish mindset, meant, uh, represented chaos and death. And the ark literally brought these people, these eight people, through chaos and death while the rest of the world was destroyed or cleansed uh, of evil. And just like that, Christ brings us through the chaos waters of the Ark of the Cross. He brings us through death to the other side where there's a new humanity. We have this opportunity with Christ, like Noah did with the Ark, to uh, have a new humanity on the other side. Again, main point, Christ suffered, it brought our vindication, it brought our hope. Now we're going to jump to the beginning of this passage. Oh, I keep double clicking. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. What he's saying here is a very simple principle. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Like you're doing good if you're serving people. Who's going to harm you? Like think about someone who is just generally a nice person, generally does good. I think of Sabrina. Who's going to get mad at Sabrina? If any of you guys know Sabrina, who's going to get mad at Sabrina? She's just the nicest person. But even if, he's saying, because they are in a context where they are undergoing persecution, and he says, do not fear their threats, do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. And Jesus said this, that there is something that separates us from the world. He said, the world is really great at loving people who love them. Uh, the world is really great at being nice to people who are nice to them. But he said, what separates us from the world is that we actually love our enemies. And he said it in Matthew 5. As you've heard it said, that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was a saying in the day. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Why are we children of our Father in heaven? Because this is eventually what Jesus is going to do for us. He's going to suffer for the evil people. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Back in their day, the tax collectors were kind of seen as the lowest of the low. Um, they kind of ripped people off and stuff like that. So he's saying, even robbers love people who love them. So if you only do that, what reward are you going to get? What makes us different is that we love our enemies, those who do wrong to us. And I think often we assume persecution when there is no persecution. We, we are hopping into a book where there was terrible persecution. Um, similar to uh, what we see in China, similar to what we see in the Middle East, terrible persecution. Here in Canada, we have it pretty good. Uh, we, like Jeff has said, we might lose a friend or two, uh, and I've lost friends over it, but I would by no means compare the suffering that I've gone through to what other Christians have gone through. And I think often we miss opportunities because we already say no for people. Um, we think we're going to get persecuted, we think they're going to reject, so we don't share with them. In my experience, it's quite the opposite. As we serve people, people are hungry to know why. Uh, as we live out the gospel, people are actually curious. And when curiosity sparks, uh, Peter says to be prepared to give an answer. Uh, a bit of my story is I, I don't know if I've shared this before, but 
first I became a believer was through a camp, Anvil Island, Daybreak Bible Camp. Uh, I went there once. For some reason, I'm going back again. But um, I had this nerdy kid invite me. Uh, actually, he invited my friend. And the only way that I would go, it, or the only way that he would go is if I went with him. And I thought, oh, it would be a great break from my Xbox for the summer because I was playing a lot of Call of Duty at the time. Uh, and I thought, oh, it would be cool to get out in nature. And I've been around church and stuff. So um, it's not going to be too intimidating for me. And my friend was pretty pretty nervous. But anyways, I go there. Um, the only thing I can say is that my heart changed. I had no I had no explanation at the time. I wasn't well-versed with the Bible. I didn't have all the theological things figured out. Uh, all I know is I went there, experienced love, heard that Jesus loved me, and that was he was giving me an opportunity to have an impact in the world as I followed him. And I went home very different. I'm not going to say I'm perfect. Absolutely not. Um, but I went home very different. Uh, and I, the only thing that I could say is my heart changed. I didn't know. Later on, I'd find out in the Bible that that's exactly what the Bible says, is you have this heart change when you experience the good news of Jesus, when you experience his love, your heart's transformed. The Bible says you go from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. Um, but I didn't have all that vocab. And my friends at the time, um, they kind of saw that, and they said, oh, you think you're better than us now. Uh, and a lot of them would say, oh, you just got sucked into a cult. Uh, this is just uh, kind of a fad, a phase you're going to go through. Um, and I, the only answer I had for their questions and for their pushback, they would bring up things, and I, I had no clue, um, things about the New Testament, things about science. I, I had no clue how to answer any of this stuff. And all, all I could say is, my heart changed, guys. Like, I don't know what to say. Like, I went home different. I, I, I can't not I can't not be different. Like, it's just my heart changed, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, and I actually had one friend, one of my best friends, message me on Facebook and he said, have a good life. Uh, and if you guys ever want to see that conversation, uh, it's pretty cool because the last, the last thing he does is have a good life. Five years later, he ends up becoming a Christian in Toronto, uh, comes back and uh, messages me and says, sorry. Uh, and, like, he's... He's been on his own journey and yada, yada. But the early disciples also kind of only had that as their reason to believe. Changed hearts and then the testimony of the the early disciples about the resurrection of Jesus. So if you're like me uh, and the only thing you had was, hey, my heart's been changed and I'm putting faith in the testimony of these people, um, by no means feel ashamed. Like, those are great answers. But I'm hoping to give you guys a bit more because in my journey, I wanted to, I, I had this conversation in my head. If I'm going to be friends over this, I want to make sure this is true. I want to make sure this isn't just some psychological manipulation that happened to me. I want to make sure this actually lines up with reality. And so I went on this journey. And so today I'm not giving you guys arguments. I'm not giving you guys ammunition against people. Uh, I'm giving you guys some reasons for the hope that you have in Christ. Some reason to believe that Jesus actually conquered the grave. Some reason that this is life to the full following him. So here's my five arguments. No arguments. I, I had no arguments, and I said arguments. Five reasons. These are no arguments. These are no ammunition. These are five reasons why I think this is reasonable. Three for a general concept of God, uh, and then two for Jesus Christ as our hope. Uh, and I'm going to take kind of a liberal approach uh, just to show that even in the most liberal ideas, we still need a creator at some point. And I'll kind of go, go through this. So just for thought's sake, we're going to assume evolution for this. I'm not arguing for evolution. But I'm going to pose that even if you believe in a naturalistic evolutionary theory, there are three points at which there has to be design involved. Uh, number one for me is DNA. Number two is consciousness, or that will be number three, but number two is fine-tuning than consciousness. So we'll get into it. DNA. First problem with DNA. The, the big problem in biology right now how did dirt go to life? How did we get elements to these complex cells? 
there's two problems with it. One is that DNA is like coding. Uh, if any of you are co coders, uh, anytime you see coding, ones and zeros, usually that came from intelligence, whether that's a, another computer uh, putting coding in or another human. Uh, and that's exactly what DNA is. It's coding. It has information in these A, C, T, Gs. Uh, I don't know if I got all those right, but there's four, uh, four things that it reads, and it, it's the instruction manual for the human body. So it has information. That is problem number one. Everything we know about information goes to intelligence. So much so that Richard Dawkins uh, even said that possibly the, the information came from further intelligent life, aliens. Like, that was a leading theory. I don't know if it still is today, um, but that is one of the leading theories uh, back in, like, the 2000s, was that intelligence from another planet planted DNA because information comes from intelligence. So that's part number one. Problem number two is the chicken and the egg problem. What's the chicken and the egg problem? Yeah, which came first? Because everything we know about chickens, they come from eggs. But in order to create an egg, you kind of need two chickens. And so that's the same with DNA. It's crazy because proteins, in order to be created, they need first proteins to read the DNA to create a protein. But in order to create DNA, you first need this complex system of proteins in order to create and replicate and duplicate DNA. So it's a super complex problem. And just so you know, this isn't just Brando's thoughts. Um, this is what Dean Kenyon said. So he wrote a book called Biochemical Predestination. And in this book, he proposed that DNA self-arose. That through some natural processes, it self-organized, and that's how we got the first DNA strand. Which is crazy because even if you get that first DNA strand, how do you replicate it in, and then form a cell with all this advanced protein? But it's crazy because six years later, he wrote a book refuting his own ideas, and he says this in it. This new realm of molecular genetics is where the most compelling evidence for design on Earth. We have not the slightest chance of a chemical evolutionary origin for even the simplest of cells. Intelligent design makes a great deal of sense as it very closely matched the multiple discoveries in molecular biology. Uh, and again, we're not giving reason for the Christian God. We're, at this point, I'm just saying, here's some reasons why there must be a creator at, at some level. And number one would be design, or DNA. Number two, uh, I think a bunch of us know uh, that we live in a very uh, fine-tuned solar system for Earth. Uh, our sun is just the right size, it com it's composed of just the right elements, we're just the right distance away, we're just the right size, we turn at just the, the right amount, we, our rotation around the sun is just the right amount. Uh, all these things, uh, and there's more, like, you guys could, could tell me even more about how fine-tuned our Earth is. Um, even our atmosphere protects us from UV rays, gamma rays, all this negative radiation, and let, yet it lets sunlight through and light, and we get to see these beautiful colors. Uh, yes, our Earth is so fine-tuned, but I know the smart people in this crowd, they're going to say, but Brandon, the universe is so expensive, there's so many solar systems, so many galaxies, um, there's got to be more Earths. Sure, we'll go with that. We'll, we'll say maybe, yeah, there definitely is potential that there's more habitable planets there. Uh, but what's crazy is that even within galaxies, there seems to be, there's arguments that even within certain galaxies, there's only a certain amount of galaxies that you can even have life. Um, but again, we'll propose there's so many possible planets for life. The crazy thing is if you go to the Big Bang, right at the beginning, again, we're assuming Big Bang is true, evolution is true, even if we go all the way back to that, there's these constants throughout the universe that seem to have been preset at the beginning of the Big Bang for life even to be possible, for atoms to stick together, uh, for the universe not to expand into oblivion or collapse immediately. Um, in 2015, Forbes magazine said that there were 26 preset constants that need to exist prior to the Big Bang in order to get a universe like ours. Uh, Nobel Prize winner Fred Hoyle said this, It looked as if a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology 
and that there are no blind forces in nature worth talking about. And again, the people I'm quoting today, none of them are believers, and I, I specifically chose that so it's not like a Christian bias. I just want to say, hey, here's the facts that we all agree on, and I'm offering a, a different narrative to why this makes sense. Uh, Stephen Hawking, a theoretical physicist and who probably doesn't need any introduction, uh, he said this, The laws of science, as we know them at present, contain many fundamental numbers like the size of the electron or the electric charge of the electron and the ratio of masses of the proton and the electron. The remarkable fact is that these, the value of these numbers seem to have been very finely, tuned, finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. And one more, just for fun, Dawkins, who's no friend of Christians, he's an evolutionary biologist, says this, Physicists have calculated that if the laws and constants of physics had been even slightly different, the universe would have developed in such a way that life would be impossible. Uh, and so that's why, I don't know if you guys follow Marvel and stuff like that, now one of the biggest theories and pop culture references is the multiverse because there's options either the multiverse exists and there's billions of universes to pop out one that just has the right properties like ours or there has to be intelligence behind our universe uh, which brings me to our third reason or my third reason for why i believe there must be a creator and that's consciousness uh, and why i say consciousness connects to the beginning of the universe is because of a pretty famous experiment. Does anyone know about the double slit experiment? Okay, so it's a pretty old experiment, and it's pretty crazy. Uh, it's going to sound really weird, but what they do is they shine photons of light through two slits. And if you imagined it, like right now, imagine it was dark. We shot two photons of light through two slits. How would you assume they would appear on the back wall? Probably like two slits, right? because that's all we have ever kind of observed. What they found was, depending on where they put the measuring device, if they put it on the back wall, somehow these photons behave like a wave. And uh, with waves, when they interfere with one another, uh, you get these kind of lines. Uh, similar to in here, there's sound waves through the speakers, and that's why in some places it'll sound really good, some places it'll sound really bad. Um, it's it's not nothing to do with the worship team. It's just waves. But in certain areas, it's going to sound good. In certain areas, it's not going to be as good because of the interference of the sound waves. So when they shot these photons of light and they put the measuring device up the wall, these photons would appear as a wave. But if they put the measuring device before, so that the fo we knew where the photons were going through, it would appear as two lines on the wall. And in kind of the implication of this is that consciousness seems to actually affect matter. That consciousness collapses the wave function into matter. So what the wave function is of these of photons is it's a series of potential places that the photon could be observed. It collapses it into an actual place. It sounds wild. It sounds super crazy. But they've done so many studies that, that the implications of this is that consciousness affects matter. And so if you rewind the clock back all the way to the beginning of the universe, you needed a conscious being there to observe the first wave function and collapse the very first particle into existence. Um, and a guy named Mitsuyu Kaku has kind of gone through that as well, but it, it's crazy. Um, Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner said this, while a number of philosophies may be logically consistent with present quantum mechanics, materialism is not. Um, because what this experiment did is it actually flips it on its head. Conscious is the foundational, consciousness is the foundational thing, not matter. Because we, we, over many years, have proposed that consciousness or the appearance of consciousness and free will has actually arisen from matter but it's the exact opposite. So part two to kind of consciousness for me is the moral implications. So let's say there's no God. Let's say consciousness isn't actually a thing, and it is just an illusion. Um, we aren't actually free beings. Everything's determined. It's just atoms bumping into atoms. Uh, the way that I would kind of give an example is 
let's say a billiard ball set or a pool set. You have that triangle of billiard balls. Theoretically, if you knew the trajectory of the first ball, you could determine where all the balls are going to land, right? So multiply that by like billions and billions. The theoretical physics is still there. You could determine where everything's going to land if you had a supercomputer. And what what it's saying is that if life is like that, if that's the Big Bang, all there is is matter, then everything is just a complex um, continuation of that. It sounds really crazy, but uh, if this is true, and the peop- certain people have actually tried to use this in the court of law, that it's not them reacting and making decisions, but it's actually their brain making them do things. Because that's the logical implications of all this, is that if there is no consciousness, then we are slaves to our brains, in essence. Uh, and again, if we, if we logically play this out, how do we hold people um, if we do hold people accountable actions, are we actually holding them accountable, or is it a brain reacting to the set of circumstances, making our body hold them accountable? Like, it's super absurd. Uh, and, again, I'll, I'll give a quote. Um, oh, Richard Dawkins. He says, good and, good and evil, I don't believe in that. There is hanging out there anything, something called good and something called evil. Uh, a little bit of the irony is Richard Dawkins has written many books on how evil... Uh, religion as a whole is. Um, not, not to like make fun of Richard Dawkins, but there is a, there's a cognitive dissonance there uh, where these ideas don't match the way we actually live in reality. Darwinist philosopher Michael Ruse, again, a Darwinist philosopher, he still subscribes to Darwinism, but here's what he, he understands that these are the implications of uh, the fact that if materialism, if atheism is true, um, these are the logical conclusions. Why should a bunch of atoms have thinking abilities? Why should I, even as I write now, be able to reflect on what I'm doing? And why should you, even as you read now, be able to ponder my points, agreeing or disagreeing, with pleasure or pain, deciding to refute me, or deciding that I'm just not worth the effort? No one, certainly not the Darwinian as such, seems to have any answer to this. The point is that there's no scientific answer. Michael Ruse. So again, that's just my reasons for why there that there has to be creator involvement at the beginning of the universe, then at DNA, then at consciousness. These kind of three points of life, there seems to have to be creator interaction or some type of intelligence uh, with our universe and with uh, humanity eventually, with consciousness. Okay, so then that brings me to two points about Jesus. Two reasonable things that why I have my hope in Jesus. Number one, the fulfillment of prophecies and cultural stories. Uh, I won't go into it because I do it every time I go up here, but we seem to just recreate the Jesus story over and over again, and we just reskin it. Whether it's Superman uh, dying for humanity, rising again uh, as he is defeated, defeats Doomsday, uh, whether it's Tony Stark uh, being defeated by Thanos, uh, t- taking on that responsibility, saving humanity, and then even Doom. I'm not going to spoil Doom. Don't worry about it. Go see it. Uh, but the whole thing is about this possible Messiah figure who's come to fulfill all these prophecies to deliver these oppressed people, uh, to, li- to lead them to a land uh, like, we just reskin the Jesus story over and over again. And, and you could trace it through all of history. There are so many stories like this. Um, and then there's also prophecies in the Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies. I'm just going to give one here Isaiah 53. This is actually in many Jewish circles, a banned chapter in their literature that they're not allowed to read. Um, it says this He grew up, this was 700 years before Jesus. Uh, so this is in the Jewish Bibles as well as ours. And he says, He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry, uh, dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. 
Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. For on us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence. Nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and through the Lord make his life an offering for sin. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he has poured out his life unto death and was numbered with transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So again, that's just one chapter. Um, there's like 300 prophecies that he fulfilled. Um, that one very clearly points to the Jesus story. If you read the Jesus story, if you know the Jesus story, um, there's so many parallels there um, that it's... So many that they have banned it in many Jewish circles. Uh, I'm going to give a minimal facts approach. So these are just agreed upon things about Jesus' life. Uh, this is kind of the second part, is that the historical data seems to um, lead, in my opinion, to the most reasonable response being that Jesus actually did raise from the dead. So there's kind of four things that are agreed upon by 75% of historical scholars, whether um, atheist, Christian, uh, agnostic, uh, irreligious. Uh, one, Jesus lived. Two, Jesus died. Uh, the tomb is empty, and there were reports of appearances. Uh, Bart Ehrman says this. Uh, he's a New Testament critic. He says, there's no scholar in any college or university in the Western world who teaches classics, ancient history, or New Testament, early Christianity, or any related field who doubts that Jesus existed. So, the Jesus myth is a popular film called Zeitgeist back in the day saying Jesus was just like all these other gods who died and rose again and he's just another myth. Um, but there's just so much overwhelming evidence for the life of Jesus even outside the Bible. People like Tacitus, Josephus, uh, and there are other scholars that um, it, it, it's just accepted that Jesus lived, he died, uh, that there were appearances of or there were claimed appearances that he rose from the dead and that the tomb was empty. Um, the empty tomb, uh, the reason that most people hold that the tomb was empty is the fact that the Jews blamed that Jesus' body was gone on the disciples. He said the disciples stole the body. So for lots of history, they blamed the disciples for stealing the body. If you're claiming that the body's stolen, it kind of says something about there not being a body in the tomb. And so the empty tomb, the fact that there's no body there, there needs to be an explanation. Uh, the other thing is the appearance of the disciples. Uh, I won't go into this too much, but um, liberal historian Paula Fredrickson says this, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say, and all the historical evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. But I do know that as a historian, that they must have seen something. So again, a liberal historian, she's not a Christian, but she's saying based on the historical data we have, they must have at least hallucinated and seen something. So most people would say, uh, in that liberal scholar, uh, New Testament critic, they would say the disciples, the reason that there's these claims of appearances is that they were in the mindset that Jesus was going to rise and so their, their minds kind of fabricated this story. And they did actually see something, but that it wasn't actually a physical person. Uh, they would say that they had hallucinations that they had seen Jesus. The problem that I kind of have with that is that it doesn't explain the other thing, which is an empty tomb. Uh, so, sure, they hallucinated, 
But then what about the empty tomb? They either would have had to gone to the wrong tomb, but he was he was in a very famous tomb, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who was on the Sanhedrin, a Jewish council. Um, very easily they could have squashed Christianity in the beginning because they could have just produced the body. There, it's over. He didn't rise from the dead. The body's there. Um, but the body's still missing. The tomb's still empty. And there are these claims of appearances. So those are kind of the reasons for belief. DNA, consciousness, fine-tuning of the earth, but also the universe. Uh, and then Jesus fulfilling historical stories uh, and also the evidence historically for his resurrection, life, death, and resurrection. At the end of the day, there is no 100% certainty. Either way, it takes a step of faith. Um, either way, there is a step of faith to be taken. Either uh, option one, Jesus was dead, the tomb is empty because the body was stolen, the disciples hallucinated, and unfortunately they died for a lie, and Jesus' body is still out there somewhere. That's option one. Option two is that Jesus rose and conquered the grave. The tomb is empty because he rose. There are appearances because he actually appeared. Uh, and the disciples claimed that and died for it because they actually did see him. Uh, and just a, a quick point, me dying for my belief in Jesus is not the same as them dying for their belief. Because I'm dying on the basis of these things. They were dying for something they saw. Um, they weren't saying we believe in Jesus and therefore we are dying. They were saying we saw my heart has been changed. I can't, like, I can't argue against that. They're saying, we saw him. We can't say we didn't see him. And for that statement, they were killed. So those are my reasons, but the question is, is it enough for you? You guys have to make your own step of faith. Either way, it's a step. Either way, it takes a leap. Um, and again, these are reasons, not ammunition, but armor. Uh, I'm going to finish with this. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give a reason for the hope that you have. Everyone who asks you, are our lives begging an answer? When was the last time someone saw our life and said, why do you act that way? Do you have hope? Why do you have this peace? Why do you have this joy? Why do you have this contentment? Uh, I've been convicted about this in the past year because I saw my grandma go through ALS, uh, die joyfully, and yet... Half the time, I can relate with people and very easily relate with people by complaining about whatever, the state of being able to afford a home or not having the exact food I want. Like, whatever it is, it's so easy to relate with one another, to complain, and yet we have so much good, we have so much hope, we have this peace in Christ, we have this joy, we have this love, and yet we're distracted. Do we live lives of hope? Uh, in... Youth, we have this mission to know, show, and share the gospel. Um, our lives have to show the gospel as much as we share it. Uh, only then our ears going to open to actually hear what we have to say. Um, and when we do share, ears will open. One of Young Life's mottos is that we seek to earn the right to be heard. Uh, that with our lives, we would earn the ears of people. That's what I have for today. Do our lives open ears or shut them? Do our lives beg an answer, and are our lives filled with hope, joy, compassion, and love? We're going to go to communion now. Again, as Sabrina said, these things uh, can be a little complicated. There's a little film on top in which uh, we'll celebrate the bread. The bread, again, representing Jesus' body broken for us. And then also the um, second foil where we can partake in the juice representing Jesus' blood poured out for us. And I'm going to read out of 1 Corinthians 11. Again, communion. Uh, it's this time where if you believe you need Jesus, uh, if you believe you need um, that you are not righteous on your own, that you need a Savior, uh, you are welcome to take communion. This is a celebration. And so Paul received this from uh, the disciples that were with Jesus, and he says this in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
God, thank you for your body. Thank you for coming for us. Thank you for uh, being the ark in which we now get to enjoy life and our past through death. Um, bless this bread as we partake together. Uh, in your name, amen. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is my new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you. The worship team is going to come up, and then um, I'm going to give a benediction and then invite you guys to uh, have a potluck lunch with us. more than a little. I can only handle grade four science after that. I'm, I'm done. If you are able, please stand and let's uh, lift our voices.
I forgot to mention that um, in the description of our YouTube video, there is a video that goes more into depth on consciousness stuff. And then there's also three book recommendations that I'd recommend to anyone who wants to kind of delve a little bit deeper. You don't have to study for thousands of hours to kind of have a surface uh, level based knowledge of this. I would say Case for Creator, Case for Christ, and Thinking by Andy Steiger. Those are linked in the description of the video. And the uh, all of this is not ammunition, uh, it's like protection. Uh, the whole point is that this gives you confidence to go out and love people, not argue with them. Um, so I'm going to leave with this. Jesus' final command to his disciples, he says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Uh, if you want me to pray for you, raise your hand, and uh, I'll pray, and then... Uh, feel free to come grab some lunch with us. Father, thank you for today. Thank you that we have a reasonable faith. Uh, thank you that we're not left as orphans, that you have given us your Holy Spirit, that you are God with us, you are Emmanuel. Um, and Lord, just help us leave today uh, just a little bit more encouraged, a little bit more like you, uh, and loving those in our spheres of influence, and help there just be those divine appointments where we can share about you, we can share the little brown book, the uh, life of Jesus, um, and yeah, that people would come to know the beauty of your, your love and your grace and your kindness and this life to the full, uh, in your name, amen. Go on God's peace.